an advantage to preaching the Word of God expositorily, verse by verse, through a book, is that you are forced to deal with what Scripture says and not just what you want to say. One of the disadvantages of expository preaching is that you have to say what the text says and not what you want to say. You have to relate God's thoughts. In this chapter, we begin, though I titled the the chapter Justice for All, it may not seem an apt title, especially when we consider that slavery is a key part of it. But let's get a little bit of background when it comes to slavery. We think of slavery as it was here in the United States for far too long a time and not necessarily how it directly relates to what's in Scripture. Slavery has existed throughout human history. Shortly after the fall, when there were enough people around for one group to enslave another, we have records of slavery going way, way back. And the sad fact of the matter is that slavery still exists today throughout this world. And I'm going to say it exists in this country, in this state. And one of the ways it exists is through something called human trafficking. And that is something that has only exploded since illegal immigration has been allowed to exist in this country. It's not that it created the problem, it exacerbated it, multiplied it, probably exponentially. And that is truly a shame. And the fact is that people who opened the border want it that way. There is a moral corruption that is a component of this whole argument that needs to be exposed and it needs to be understood. But there's also something else called economic slavery. You can be in virtual slavery by your own uncontrolled spending. When credit is made too easy, credit cards are so easy to get and uh, so so hard to pay off if you don't keep short accounts with it. We also have the problem of broken families causing this same sort of economic slavery. And unfortunately, tax law and many other things in our country promote broken families over whole families. And you get people with no job skills trying to enter the labor market and wondering why they can't make a living. When you have no marketable skills, it leads you into economic slavery, and that economic slavery grows worse when your dependence on government increases. Because government will never be able to provide a wage that is truly comfortable. It's just impossible. But all of that plays into what we're talking about with slavery here in this text, as we'll see in just a moment. But because of a text like Exodus chapter 21, many people judge the Bible harshly for not completely ending slavery when, quote, God had the opportunity to do so, end quote. That is to look at things from a human standpoint and for a human to judge God, and Scripture presents that always is a result of foolishness. What God chooses to do, knowing the heart of man and the corruption that was in mankind, he chooses to humanize the institution rather than calling for its outright abolition. And in fact, if owners of slaves would have and would follow what is said here in this text and some others that we can add to it from the various other books of the Pentateuch, you would find that the biblical laws were more strict in what an owner of slaves could do and who could be a slave and so forth than laws may be anywhere else. Because again, slavery exists whether we like it or not. And there is a proper humane treatment that is expected by God in those situations. Let's look at the first couple of verses of Exodus chapter 21 where we read, Now these are the rules that you shall set before them, before the people of Israel. When you buy a Hebrew slave, he shall serve six years, and in the seventh he shall go out free for nothing. So here we begin with laws concerning what I'll call domestic slavery. That is slavery of Jewish people by Jewish people. You say, why would that occur? Well, it's akin to what is known historically as indentured servants or slaves. That's obvious by the context of what is stated here. So 
The first thing that is noted is that Hebrew slaves could be bought. Now, we'll give that a little bit more context. How or why would someone be purchased? You could understand it if it was an enemy and you, somebody captures them and they sell this person down the line and so forth. But the things that two major issues in Israel that could cause a Hebrew, an Israelite, to become a slave are, first of all, debt and secondly, theft. If you were in debt and had a debt which you could not reasonably hope to pay, Leviticus chapter 25, verse 39, is, uh, gives us the example of that person being sold for their debt. But again, the maximum term of that is six years, as we've seen, and we'll reiterate here in just a moment. We actually have an example of this in the story in 2 Kings chapter 4. You can look at that a little bit later, verses 1 through 7. A woman comes pleading for her sons because of a debt that was owed to a certain individual. But theft also could cause slavery according to the next chapter, Exodus chapter 22 and verse 3, that if a person is caught stealing, depending on the severity of that theft and so forth, they could be made a slave to repay the person who was defrauded, who was cheated in the theft that was concerned. Imagine if that were happening today. Uh, it would eliminate a lot of crime that goes on because people realize that you know, they're not, not going to get much. In fact, you can steal from the average uh, store up to $1,000 in many parts of our country, and it's not even something they can prosecute you for. makes no sense. What does that do? It just provides more opportunity for crime. But this type of servant or slave was to be freed after six years there was a term there that was limited. It couldn't go beyond that. And then when the seventh year rolled around, they were to be freed. And they were to be freed without any redemption money changing hands. You see, we'll, we'll look at later points in the passage where a redemption price could be paid to remove another penalty that the law prescribed. But in this case, there is no longer a redemption price that six years has satisfied either the debt or the theft that had occurred. But the interesting thing was that these verses also tell us that this individual was not to leave empty-handed. And if we compare this with Deuteronomy 15, verses 12 through 14, we'll see that they were to be given provisions from the flock and from the field and so forth. There were a variety of things that were to be given to this person. Why do you think that was? Well, it's so they don't end up back in this same position. They don't need to be an indentured servant any further because they have the means to get started in life. They don't need to be a thief because they have something that is available to them to start with and then their own industry should see them on their way. And that seems to be the logic that Scripture introduces. But now comes something and it gets a little bit more uncomfortable perhaps. Notice verses 3 through 6. If he, that is this slave, this indentured servant, comes in into slavery, single, he shall go out of slavery, single. If he comes in married, then his wife shall go out with him. If his master gives him a wife and she bears him sons or daughters, the wife and her children shall be her masters, and he shall go out alone. But if the slave plainly says, I love my master, my wife, and my children, I will not go out free, then his master shall bring him to God and he shall bring him to the door of the doorpost, and his master shall bore his ear through with an awl, and he shall be a slave forever. Now, did you find any of that uncomfortable? Of course you did, if you're just simply thinking. There are several things that seem to be out of kilter. But don't judge God by human standards. Let God be God. And so that's the way I'm going to present this chapter and succeeding chapters that may have illustrations of inst instances where we would have a different idea. And keep that quote in mind from Scripture, will a man dare to judge God? So we have the case here of the slave who 
is married. If he was married when he was, became a slave, he's to go out married. If he was single and married since, he's to go out single. So he would leave slavery in the original marital status that he held when he became a slave. That's God's provision. But a slave who marries another slave is to leave alone. Now, this appears to be two different categories of slaves. The one is the indentured servant only serving for six years. The other is likely a slave for life, unless something happens to change that. And so what is being protected here is private property. Now, it's uncomfortable for us to think of people as property, but this, inter- this individual concerned in this particular scenario, in order to retain his wife, had to elect to become a permanent slave. Now, that would be impacted by how he has been treated and what family life has been like and a lot of other things, perhaps. But this is what God says. And I can't give you a theological reason for why this is to be this way. And I don't have to. I'm simply reporting what God has said. But the owner, again, has a right to his property, even if that property is a person. We don't like to think of individuals as property. We have a political class that likes to think of people as property. They like to think of certain niches in the electoral body of citizens as belonging to them. And therefore, you're beholden. You have to vote for them. It's just the fact that this still happens. Uh, We still have this sinful tendency. That'll all be corrected one day, will it not? But then we also have the situation of a man selling his daughter as a slave. And again, this is not comfortable. I would never think of selling my daughter as a slave. But I wasn't in that time frame, and we'll talk about that as we go through. When a man sells his daughter as a slave, she shall not go out as the male servants or male slaves do. If she does not please her master who has designated her for himself, in other words, to marry him, then he shall let her be redeemed. Her family can buy her out of slavery." He shall have no right to sell her to a foreign people since he has broken faith with her. If he designates her for his son, he shall deal with her as with a daughter. If he takes another wife to himself, he shall not diminish her food, her clothing, or her marital rights. And if he does not do these three things for her, she shall go out for nothing without payment of money." So again, we're talking about an uncomfortable subject. This is a slave wife. So the daughter is sold for the purpose of marriage. That's the context of what's going on here. If for some reason the person who has acquired her, perhaps because the father was in debt, perhaps this satisfies that debt, perhaps there is another reason. We're not told the reasoning. We're just simply told how it was to be handled in these various cases. That in any case, the master was not at liberty to sell this Hebrew, Jewish woman to a foreign individual. The master had to marry her or allow her to be redeemed. He could not sell her to this foreigner that is mentioned here. So in other words, it keeps things in-house. It keeps things within the boundaries of the people of Israel. And you remember how God looked upon the people of Israel versus the other people, the pagans around them. There's a very distinct difference. And so that's being maintained here. There also isn't the idea of the repetitive selling of the same slave. This is a stable environment in which people are working and being given certain considerations. It's also mentioned if she was to marry the master's son, the householder's son, that the householder then is to treat her as a daughter. And that involves several things that are mentioned here in this text, but it's overall assuring she's going to be cared for properly 
until marriage and even beyond marriage, that he continues to view her as a daughter. Imagine how that might change how a man would act toward a servant in this situation. That makes a big difference. It makes a difference in a moral level as well as in just the societal level of just having a relationship, a friendship, or whatever. But it says very particularly here that if something goes wrong in this whole relationship, if another wife is taken or whatever, this one's marital rights could not be denied. And three categories of marital rights are mentioned. One is food. She couldn't be downgraded, starved, for instance, given a different level or quality of food. She couldn't be deprived of a normal level of clothing that would match what her station required for her. And then there's also what, uh, was what I read in the text as her marital rights. This could include conjugal rights, and it could simply be involved with lodging. I think both are probably involved. But it is to say that once she is taken on by this master or his son as a wife, that cannot change. In fact, there's no provision of divorce in this case. Uh, This is to remain the same. And if anything is altered, she is to go free without a redemption cost being uh, included, but probably including the provisions that verse 2 had mentioned for the slave that goes out, including some basic necessities to go on with life. Because, as the statement was made, he has broken faith with her. He's broken a contract. And that contract, if not honored, requires her release. We come to verse 12. Let's read the next couple of verses. Whoever strikes a man so that he dies shall be put to death. Now, that's going to be qualified rather quickly. But if he did not lie in wait for him, but God let him fall into his hand, then I will appoint for you a place to which he may flee. But if a man willfully attacks another to kill him by cunning, You shall take him from my altar that he may die. So here we begin a section which runs through verse 27 on the laws against violence. How to handle violent encounters between individuals. The first is one individual taking another person's life, the taking of human life. And you'll notice a difference between the taking of human life and what's dealt with later on in the text, the taking of animal life. It's not the same level at all. So what happens? In the case of willful murder, that is punishable by death. Now, Scripture gives, especially if we revert to Genesis chapter 9, and we'll look at that in just a few minutes, Scripture presents that God is the giver of human life. And that as the giver of human life, he has created that life in his image. Both male and female are created in the image of God. We have dignity. We have worth because of that. And the desecration of that image, the image of God, through the killing of an image bearer, an individual, is deserving of death. Genesis 9, verse 6 says, Whoever sheds the blood of man, mankind, including both sexes, by man shall his blood be shed, for God made man in his own image. So this is the background, the reason for the exaction of the penalty. And we'll come to a little bit more explanation of this as we go forward. But it is often stated today in our country that Capital punishment, the execution of one who is guilty of murder, does not curtail further murders. Well, no, it doesn't when it takes you 30 and 40 years to kill a guy. There is no deterrent factor. But, and the book of Ecclesiastes says that, that justice delayed just destroys the entire concept of justice and makes people think it's never going to happen. But the one certain thing when capital punishment is exacted is that person will never kill again. And we have so many situations of serial killers 
that it's obvious that when a person has crossed that line, there frequently is no going back from it. But then the distinction is made in verse 13 about unintentional killing and saying that is not worthy of death. And again, this is a different category. And individuals who want to lampoon the idea of capital punishment, death for death, will say, well, then everybody that uh, even in an accident, no, the Bible very clearly explains that that is not true. It uses the phrase that person has not it was not lying in wait. In other words, they weren't plotting for the death and the demise of that person. But rather it is said that God delivered him into the other's hand. That providence, we could put it that way, brought this individual to his end. That in a way unknown to mankind, that even in accidental death, God who could prevent such things allows them to happen. And though it's not directly an act of God, it is interesting that God is mentioned in that thought process behind why this is not punishable by death. That individual is to be provided for safety in a city of refuge, which are shortly to be delineated when they get in over into the uh, land of Israel anyway, uh, 40 years from this point. They'll have this set out for them. But in the meanwhile, there was always the altar of God. And someone could come to the altar of God, which had not yet been constructed, is about to be, uh, and that would be another place of refuge. But it's interesting that on the heels of that, this sanctuary idea that Scripture introduces here, that willful murderers are not to be afforded such protection. The idea is that when a person wants to kill someone, and thinks they may be caught, they're going to run to the city of refuge or grab a hold of the horns of the altar of God, trying to get the same clemency that is merited by the individual who did not kill from intent. But Scripture says that such plotting as is involved in willful murder means that the people of God are to take that person, drag that person away from the altar of God, and let justice be visited upon that individual. It's interesting how clearly God makes these distinctions. They're not such fine points of law, and yet people tend to confuse things, especially as far as the biblical perspective goes. Verses 15 through 17 read as follows, Whoever strikes his father or his mother shall be put to death. That's interesting because it doesn't say strikes and kills. We'll get back to that. Whoever steals a man and sells him and anyone found in possession of him shall be put to death. Whoever curses his father or his mother shall be put to death. Now, I can't really say that I understand the logic of why God puts verse 16 between 15 and 17. 15 and 17 seem to be better grouped together. That's the way I'll consider it in the notes, but I'm not making improvement on Scripture. God put it in the order He did for a reason, and I just don't understand it, so I'll just put it out there, okay? But it is said that abuse of parents is punishable by death, and this includes striking mother or father and without killing them, just having the temerity to strike your parents is enough to merit the death penalty. Not only that, cursing them, not lifting a hand, just railing on them with your words and bringing a curse with your words upon them is also worthy of death. God doesn't look very kindly at individuals doing anything short of honoring their father and their mother. And that is what God expects. But then verse 16, kidnapping steals an individual and selling that individual. That also is worthy of death. Can you think of any illustrations of that happening in Scripture? Shouldn't take you long. Joseph's brothers, exactly what they did. Now, this law was not in place at that point, but it certainly would have come to the mind of the people of Israel as they knew the stories of their forefathers This happens a lot of times in war where people will take an opportunity to 
steal away someone and sell them for a profit or just, just for maliciousness. And the idea is they sell this individual for their own enrichment. This is a ransom being offered. And you think of the horrors of things like sex trafficking today and money being exchanged for the possession of those individuals involved in such a thing. And there's even such a thing as selling people for organ harvesting. These are horrendous things that happen in our world. So I'm just trying to relate it to the fact that the world hasn't changed all that much. We're still living in a very sin-cursed, fallen world. But it's also interesting to note that anyone who is caught with the kidnapped person is also worthy of death. And you could think of several ways in which this might happen. In other words, a person intends to sell, they kidnap the individual, but before the sale can be made, they're caught. They're still worthy of death. But it could also be that an individual steals someone and sells them, and then the buyer is encountered with this individual. The buyer as well is worthy of death, and anyone who is an intermediary between those points. So you see, the death penalty is far broader in Scripture than most people even understand. And there's a reason for it. There are certain things that are just simply not to be tolerated in any shape, manner, or form. Verses 18 and 19 introduce another scenario. When men quarrel and one strikes the other with a stone or with a fist, and the man does not die but takes to his bed, then if the man rises again and walks outdoors with his staff, he who struck him shall be clear, only he shall pay for the loss of his time and shall have him thoroughly healed. So here is the matter of fighting. And the situation is explained that there is this quarrel that develops that results in violence, one striking the other and back and forth. But notice the weapons that are mentioned, a hand or a stone that might be found lying about. The idea is that there is not premeditation here. It is something that happens because of the heat of a moment. It is not without its consequences. Because if the person survives who is injured, then the other is responsible for the complete recovery of that person to get them to the point where they can go back to their normal way of life and also to compensate for lost wages. So there's the matter of compensation. God is very concerned that justice follow certain acts. Verses 20 and 21, the striking of a slave. When a man strikes his slave, male or female, with a rod, and the slave dies under his hand, he shall be avenged. Who's being avenged? The one who died. His death is to be avenged. But if the slave survives a day or two, he is not to be avenged, for the slave is his money. And perhaps that last part is what you know, kind of sits us a little awkward in our way of looking at it. Let's talk about it a little bit. The striking of a slave. There is in this text not an explicit but an implicit acceptance of the fact that the master of a slave has the right to punish corporeally his slaves. But that must be done within certain limitations. There is the assumption that this could happen. And the statement is made that if the slave dies during the beating, then his death is to be avenged. We're not exactly told how that death is avenged, but I take from the context of the chapter and the other things that have been discussed that there are two ways in which that might occur. And I'm taking into account verse 30, which we haven't gotten to yet, as well as what we've seen in the past. I would say that this avenging is talking about either the death penalty being applied to the master or a redemption price to redeem his life from that penalty being given in exchange for him causing this death and beating the slave to death. Now, these kinds of things are almost never in place. 
In Roman slavery, you could beat a slave and kill him, and then nobody cared because that was the way human life was viewed. Here, there is a heightening of the sense of worth of the human being in spite of the fact that slavery is still permitted. Interestingly, though, it says that the slave survives a day or two, and that would give the impression that after a day or two, the slave dies. I think that's a part of the implication of the text. Not always, but it's really, you know, it's really applying, I think, more particularly to that case. Then the penalty that is exacted is basically the slave owner has lost money on the deal. And you think, well, that's not too just. Again, we don't judge God. This is the way God laid it out. And the idea is this man, this slave owner, paid money for the possession of this slave, and now he has only cheated himself. So now he's probably going to have to pay money to replace that slave's service and buy another slave. And that would get around and people would get to know that this is the tendency of this individual and may impact that idea of number three there, whether it's the death penalty or redemption price included as a possibility. But then we come to the text, verses 22 through 25, that I referenced this morning when I talked a little bit about what we would be studying. When men strive together, that's going back to verse 18, a fight erupts between two individuals, and hit a pregnant woman. The idea is she's a bystander. Maybe she is the wife of one of the men in the altercation. We're not exactly told. But she is hit in such a way so that her children come out, but there is no harm. The one who hit her shall be fined as the woman's husband shall impose on him, and he shall pay to the, as the judges determined. But if there is harm, then you shall pay life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, stripe for stripe. So we have the case here of striking a pregnant woman. And what I read there, and depending on what version you're looking at, it can be slightly different, of course. But what I read there is she is hit and her children come out. This is what we would call a premature birth. And that's what the text is signifying. But I want us to understand that when an individual comes to Scripture to try to justify a preconceived notion that they have, they will often grasp at straws and exercise very desperate hermeneutics to try to get what they think stated in Scripture. It's a dangerous thing to come to Scripture with a preconceived notion and decide that this is the way it has to be. There is no one who, with an honest reading of the entirety of Scripture, would come away with the idea that God approves of abortion. That is just simply not true. Some try to justify this by taking uh, this as abortion, and what they do is they mistranslate, in my estimation, this word, uh, come out, her children come out. They mistranslate it as miscarry. And I say mistranslate because there are a variety of translations that do exactly this and use the word miscarry. You have the contemporary English version. You've probably not heard of it. The Good News translation, the Revised Standard Version, as well as the New Revised Standard Version, are all relatively well-known translations that use the word miscarry in this context and result in misinterpreting the context. The word used here, the the Hebrew word is yatsa, and though that means nothing at all to you, uh, I just thought I'd put it on the screen anyway and be glad I didn't put it in the uh, Hebrew script because then it would make even less sense to you. Um, Yatsa is used in Scripture of live birth. Let me explain a little bit. Yatsa is used like several hundred times in various forms in Scripture and can mean a variety of things. But one of the things that it means 
repeatedly is a live birth. And I've given you some references. For the advantage of those who perhaps are listening at home and don't have the advantage of having the notes in their hand, let me mention some of them. Genesis 15, verse 4. Genesis 17, verse 6. Genesis 25, verse 25. Don't worry that I'm going too fast. People that listen to it on the internet can rewind. Okay? Genesis 25, verse 26, 35, verse 11, Genesis 38, 28 to 30, Genesis 46, 26, and Exodus 1, verse 5. Why do I take the time to mention each of these? I'm only mentioning the ones that are used up to this text, the usages of Yatzah in the Hebrew text up to Exodus chapter 21. Why? Because I want to show you that this was a common use of the word that it regularly refers to, for instance, one of the phrases you'll see in some of these verses is, for instance, a promise made to Abraham that kings would come out from his loins. Obviously, it has to be live birth or, you know, they're not going to be a king. Nobody promotes to king someone who isn't alive and was never born alive. But it also talks about various individuals in the history of the Jewish nation who were born, who came out from their mother. So it is a normal way of reference. And you will find that throughout the rest of the Old Testament as well. I just didn't want to look through all of those references, and I thought it was fair to bring it up to this point. One thing I want you to note is that looking through all of the references of Yatzah in the Old Testament, I did not find one use indicating miscarriage. Not one. If it's related to birth, it's live birth. Now, there is a word in the Hebrew Old Testament that refers to miscarriage. It's the word nephel. Nephel is used three times in the Old Testament regarding miscarriage. It is Job chapter 3, verse 16, Psalm 58, verse 8, and Ecclesiastes 6, verse 3. Each of these very clearly is relating to a miscarriage, one who is born out of time and that has devastating effects. Nephel is not found in Exodus 21, verse 22. So the word that does not, does not ever mean miscarry is there in this verse, and the word that does mean miscarriage is not present in the verse. What does it tell you? It tells you that's not what we're talking about. And in fact, the rest of the context probably made sense to your mind in the context of a premature birth, so much so that you didn't even think about it. So I would say that is the best translation, but I will admit that if you put that into the text as translation, it is an interpretive translation. Interpretive translations are not always a bad thing. We see them frequently in Scripture, and we appreciate their meaning when they accurately reflect the text and the thought process behind the text. There are several translations of Scripture that actually, in this verse 22, use this phrase, when men strive together and hit a pregnant woman so that she has a premature birth, and those translations are these, the Christian Standard Bible used by many Southern Baptists, just so you know where that comes from. Legacy Standard Bible, which is more of a more recent translation and is gaining increasing support because of its very conservative underpinnings. The New American Standard Bible and the New International Version, better known as the NIV to most people, they all use this phrase, premature birth, and I congratulate them for doing so. It makes the text super clear. A person reading this is not going to come to the conclusion that here we're talking about a baby who is stillborn and nothing's done about it. That's not the point. Because the next part of the verse says, if there is this fight and this premature birth, if there is no harm, and the idea is to mother or child then a fine is to be imposed by the husband and approved by judges. There is to be a monetary compensation. Does that sound 
like a good idea. Sure it does. Now, there is another case where harm does come to mother or child. The child is not living, for instance. That would be a huge loss. The mother is killed. Or there is some sort of maiming. And then what is to happen is that the, the harm to the mother or the child is to be punished in one-to-one -one correspondence based on what happened. And that's where we get this statement, life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, stripe for stripe. And I ask you, does this sound like justice? It only does not sound like justice to the guilty. But to those of us who are in a very objective frame of reference where it's not impacting me right now, that's objective. I can think outside of myself. We would see this as justice. And there are some people say, if eye for eye were always followed out, all the world would be blind. That is a foolish misrepresentation of this text. That is just so ludicrous that anyone who says that in a public forum should be laughed off the stage because they don't understand the context. This statement here in Scripture is a limitation. And those same limitations apply to other scenarios, whether they are stated or not. And this idea of justice is what marks the difference between justice and revenge. Justice must be retributive. Do you understand that phrase? It must exact retribution. Or it's not justice. But justice should never be allowed to descend to the level of revenge. Because what's the level of revenge? You took out my eye, I take out both of yours. You offended my grandmother, I kill you. you know, these are the kinds of exaggerations that happen when justice is not in view and revenge is the motive. Retributive justice is something that scriptures wholeheartedly endorse and teach as something that is good for society. But notice, again, this is a limitation, but this same pairing of punishment is going to be used in other cases and other crimes throughout the Old Testament as simply saying that the punishment ought to fit the crime. That used to be a bedrock principle of American jurisprudence. Sadly, it is not today. There are many justices, judges, who are willing to inflict punishment on society for producing such a wicked person. And so they do nothing to the criminal, but release him into general population. That's not justice, my friends. Because while society bears some responsibility, perhaps, especially for how certain individuals turn out, that individual still bears personal responsibility. And if punishment fits the crime, this will certainly deter crime, will it not? If I harm someone by X manner, well, that same thing is coming right back to me. But it also has the secondary effect of restoring a sense of justice to the victim. And what has happened, unfortunately, in courtrooms around the world is that the victims almost get ignored because of other considerations. And so an individual who has been victimized by a criminal walks out of the courtroom now having been doubly victimized by the system. What will that produce? It's going to produce anger. It may produce additional crimes. It's certainly not going to produce anything like justice and not a deterrent to crime. So what is justice? Justice 
seeks to be, well, let me just say it the negative, justice that seeks to be more humane than God is, removing the death penalty, not being so rough and, you know, going easy on the criminal, is doomed to abuse the victim and coddle the criminal. You do things God's way or you're going to pay some awful penalties. And we're in the midst of paying some awful penalties because justice has been subverted and there are a segment of any, there is a segment of any populace, not only in the United States, that actually enjoys to have it just like that, injustice. They're the criminals. Verses 26 and 27 When a man strikes the eye of his slave, male or female, and destroys it, he shall let the slave go free because of the eye. If he knocks out the tooth of his slave, male or female, he shall let the slave go free because of his tooth. Now, again, think about that as as it would relate to a lot of the punishments inflicted on slaves over the years, even to this day. Where the injury of a slave results from the master's anger and Lack of control, a loss of an eye, for instance, is to result in the freedom of the slave. Again, I refer you to verse 2, that he would go out with something in hand. He would go out with some other compensation in addition to his freedom. The loss even of a tooth is cause for the slave to be freed. So again, this puts a limit as to what a slave owner could do and how he could treat his slaves if he knew that he could be personally liable for any damage that occurs. So again, the provisions of verse 2, allowing this slave to leave, but to have the means of living for a short time as they get their feet back on the ground, is a principle of this text. Verse 28, when an ox gores a man or a woman to death, the ox shall be stoned, its flesh shall not be eaten, but the owner of the ox shall not be liable. But if the ox has been accustomed to gore in the past and its owner has been warned, but has not kept it in and it kills a man or woman, the ox shall be stoned and its owner also shall be put to death. If a ransom is imposed on him, then he shall give for the redemption of his life whatever is imposed on him. If it gores a man's son or daughter, he shall be dealt with according to this same rule. If the ox gores a slave, male or female, the owner shall give to their master 30 shekels of silver and the ox shall be stoned. So you see the taking of human life, even and the penalty that it it, it exacts, even applies to animals. So here are laws concerning animals in the balance of this chapter. What we read about is, first of all, the case of an ox killing a person. And if this is something that just kind of happens out of the blue, the ox still is to be stoned. It could be killed. And the meat cannot even be eaten. So the owner is out completely. There is... Yeah, this compensation, this, this, this uh, retribution, you might say, that, that comes to the owner. But the reason the ox is killed and that the meat cannot be eaten is because this creature has been responsible for shedding human blood and killing that individual created in the likeness of God. But the owner has no further liability. They can't come after him in any other way. Now, That is changed if there is a case of negligence. That's what's described in verses 29 to 30. That is, the owner is warned, this ox is dangerous. It's injured several people. It's caused problem. This ox has some bad tendency. And this owner does nothing to control the situation, to prevent injury or death. And then the ox kills a a person. That ox as well is to be stoned. And again, the same restriction would be on it, that the eating of the meat would be outlawed. But now it says the owner must be put to death. So the level goes up when there is negligence involved, that you had the opportunity to take action to prevent something further from happening, and you did nothing. But there's also the provision for the owner to pay a ransom for his life. 
Now, we're not told how that ransom is established. So I would go back to what we saw in verses 22 to 25 with the idea of the woman, the pregnant woman who was struck. And who set the fine? The husband. Who approved or adjusted that fine? The judges. So it's probably a similar situation. The family kind of sets a price for this owner of the ox to pay. And then the judges are probably involved to justify that that sounds like a reasonable and equitable situation. So this is a case in which the individual could buy back their life. They're guilty. They're worthy of death. But this isn't normally the case, especially where you're talking about an individual taking the life of an individual. That is never an exception that is approved. But this is because it's an animal that is doing the action and it gives some sort of leeway. This, the text says nothing about if this happens again. I'm guessing the first time it may be you get to pay a redemption price, but if it happened ever again, you could expect the death penalty. That's just my reading between the lines and just thinking through the, the ideas. In verse 31, the ox kills what I believe to be the family member of the owner. It's not clearly stated, but that's the best I think I can uh, um, parse out the verse. And again, the ox is to be stoned, the meat not eaten, though that's not stated, it's implied, it's running through this whole text. But then the statement that was made is that he shall be subject, he shall be dealt with according to the same rule, gives the idea that the owner's life may well be in danger. If the community decides that that is what needs to happen, the judges make that decision, that could also be the same result. So that is something not stated exactly. You just kind of have to read that in. What, what, what were the other cases? Verse 32, an ox kills another person's slave. The slave owner is to be given 30 shekels of silver. We've seen that price come up a couple of times. And again, the ox is stoned. Again, the owner loses any benefit from it because not even the meat is eaten. He just loses that creature altogether. Verses 33 and 34, an animal falls into a pit that someone has dug and not left adequate notice or uh, protection around the pit. And Scripture says, then the digger of the pit is going to be responsible. Let's read those verses. I see I didn't even read them. When a man opens a pit or when a man digs a pit and does not cover it and an ox or a donkey falls into it, the owner of the pit shall make restitution. He shall give money to its owner and the dead beast shall be his. When one man's ox butts another's so that it dies... Then they shall sell the live ox and share its price, and the dead beast also they shall share. Or if it was known that the ox had been accustomed to gore in the past and its owner had not kept it in, he shall repay ox for ox, and the dead beast shall be his. So what we have here, again, is the animal falls into the pit, and the digger of that pit is responsible. There is, even today a similar kind of provision on many insurance policies. For instance, if you have a homeowner's policy, you may have a provision labeled, it might be under different names by now, but the provision of, uh, regarding the attractive nuisance. That is, you leave a ladder propped up against a, a building. A kid might climb that ladder. You would be responsible. You dig a hole, you don't have it marked. You would be responsible. So th there is a way in which this comes into even modern law and uh, insurance practices. And what happens? The one who dug the pit has to pay the owner the value of the animal. But the digger of the pit gets to keep the animal. What's the implication then? If he gets to keep the animal, there's no longer the restriction against not eating the meat. And that makes sense because the animal just lost its own life. And so then the hide as well as the meat and everything is available for the individual who dug the pit. They can sell the, the uh, meat and so forth. They can use it for themselves. But the idea is there is some justice. The digger of the pit is responsible for the damage. There was also in verses 35 and 36, an ox kills another person's ox. In a case without the 
other provisions that come up. The live ox is sold. The money is divided between the owners and then both share the dead ox. They can eat the flesh, they can keep the hide, and so on and so forth. But this changes if negligence, just as we saw above, happens. Then the guilty party, the negligent one, gets the dead ox. The innocent party gets compensation, but it's described as ox for ox. It could be that the ox is just transferred ownership to this, new, this other individual, or if perhaps this isn't as good an ox, then a price could be put on it. So you see, we're looking through a variety of situations and establishing for the people of Israel that in order for people to live at peace with their neighbors, there, has to, there have to be laws. Sometimes we run afoul of the laws, and a retribution needs to be exacted. But these laws were to be, in, uh, to be enforced justly. You know, you could have really great laws on the books, and our country has some really good laws. Unfortunately, they're not usually addressed in a just manner. You see, justice matters to each of us. Each of us wants to be treated justly when we are the offended individual. And so it should be our concern as well that justice occur where others are involved. We might ask ourselves the question, why does God in include such picayune laws in the Word of God? Well, do you realize that this has served as the basis of laws in many countries? It's a way to look at justice from an even-handed perspective. And God gives us these, in, these pieces of information that whether our country is doing what it should be or is following laws of justice, it does illustrate the fact that God does know what justice looks like. I trust that the Word of God will help us answer other questions as we go along that we'll be able to share with other individuals what we're learning. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your Word. Thank you for your guidance as we've gone through these texts. Lord, we confess that we don't understand everything in the same clarity with, it, with which you understand it, but we do understand the importance of mankind following the rules you have set up. So Lord, help us to seek to be just, to seek to be fair in our dealings with other individuals, as your word describes those principles. And Lord, we pray that you would help us by so doing to be a witness to those around us and also to correct those who speak falsely, either accusing you, your word, or justice in general. Lord, guide us. This week we will have opportunity to show forth the name of Christ in a responsible way, in a way that could lead others to know Jesus Christ. Unfortunately, we'll also be faced with situations where we could dishonor the name of Christ, keep us from doing so. Help us always to seek your aid, to respond as you would have us respond, so that your name would be glorified. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.